We're going to look at about eight or so species today and give you a few pointers on how to identify them and hopefully increase your enjoyment of woodlands. There's not many orchids which occur in woodlands. I think partly because orchids are quite summery plants and so much of woodland flora is a, is a spring thing before the canopy closes over. This is a really striking one which often occurs alongside bluebells and it's called early purple orchid. The flowers have got this very rich colour and these hooded tops but the thing which really gives it away are these leaves which are intensely spotted. Now there's only really two orchids which have this, the early purple and the common spotted. Common spotted are a bit more complicated because there's a group of them which include the marsh orchids and other ones. So the spots on these leaves, it, it's slightly hard to see as the leaves get older, but they're, they're slightly longer going up and down the leaf rather than across, and that's what makes it early purple. If they were going more across the leaf, it would be common spotted or one of its relatives. And the fact we're in a woodland where you're unlikely to find common spotted orchid. Now there's not many grasses, uh, sedges and rushes which, which occur in woodland, again because of these shaded environments, they're not particularly happy. But this one is actually a woodland specialist. It only grows in woodlands and often you see it in banks uh, on tracks leading through woodlands. It's called wood melic. And at this time of year, it's really distinctive because of this inflorescence, this flower head, uh, which it sort of reminds me of rice plants, if you've ever seen these, these sort of dark seedlets dangling down. If it's not in flower, there's actually still a way you can identify it so at the base of the leaf, which is also the, the top of the sheath, which is the, the sort of stem forming bit below, the top of the sheath forms this needle-like spike. It doesn't normally project like this. You have to sort of bend the leaf back to see it. But if you ever find a grass in a woodland and it's got this spike on it, it, it has to be wood melic. There's, there's nothing else which has that rather unusual structure. This is Lords and Ladies Aram Maculatum, uh, one of our wild members of the lily family. It's just wonderful at this time of year. It's a really striking and very unusual flower. It's called Lords and Ladies. There's a couple of reasons. That The main one is the leaves often have uh, black blotches on, and that's uh, similar to in the sort of Georgian period where the aristocracy used to put black spots uh, on their faces for, for beauty spots. The other slightly more prosaic reason is the uh, shape of the flowering parts themselves with obviously a sort of a rather male part and surrounded by a rather more female part which I think you can see. The actual flowers are down in, in the base of the plant and you can't see them at all, they've been enclosed and what you have is this huge device to attract insects. This bit coming out here is the spadix and then it's surrounded by these leaves which have this sort of slimy mucus on the inside. And what happens, insects are attracted towards it, slide down to the bottom, and they're held there, not forever, but long enough to really sort of crawl around, ensure pollination, and then eventually they escape and go off to a new plant. The brilliant thing it does is the spadix is actually maintained at 15 degrees above ambient temperature. So you can shoot it with a, with a thermal imagery camera and you get this this red color around it what that does is releases the smell of it to a much broader area now particularly in late summer and as they go darker you can actually have a sniff oh that is absolutely atrocious it's a sort of it's quite hard to put your finger on it's a sort of dead animal mixed with animal dropping smell it's really really intense and of course the flies absolutely love it. They'll come in from a long way away. So the, the intensity of the smell combined with this heat, uh, it will really bring them in. So it's really clever. It's almost reminiscent of carnivorous plants, but of course it's not eating the insects. It's just trapping them in a, in a really clever way. What you can see is as the insects slide down this slippery sheath, the first thing they hit is this sort of one-way gate system with these stiff hairs coming out. The next thing is they go past the male part of the flower, uh, picking up the pollen, and then finally down to the female bit at the end. And those bits at the end, in the autumn, you see that as a sort of spike of, of red berries. 
Now, obviously, what that will mean is that it will actually self-pollinate, which it wants to avoid. But, of course, what happens is eventually these insects will escape up at the top, and at that point they will leave with pollen and probably go straight to another flower. But it's an incredible structure. It's an incredibly sort of complex mechanism uh, of ensuring pollination, particularly with the, um, the heat-scented spadix which is which is really unique to this species you see it quite a lot in the tropics with with other members of the lily family but it's a it's an unusual thing in this country this is wood anemone which can form spectacular carpets in in woodland particularly in the spring these flowers are almost over but they're just about holding their own and they're a beautiful white with this sort of pink venation through it which just offsets the color the flowers, as much as they're incredibly showy, are actually incapable of producing much seed. Nearly all the seed they produce is sterile. And as a result, the plant really only spreads by vegetative means, i.e. the roots uh, in the ground. It spreads incredibly slowly, a matter of centimetres each year, and therefore doesn't tend to colonise new areas at all. For this reason, it's one of the classic uh, woodland indicator species. If you ever find wood anemone in a wood, it will tend to imply that is an ancient woodland, i.e. it's been there since the year 1600. This is a, a funny little plant called Sanical. It's actually, it's a member of the Umbellifer or, or carrot family, which actually you can sort of see at this time of year. It's got this uh, sort of compound head with lots of little flowers, which is slightly reminiscent of things like cow parsley and hogweed. It's a, it's a member of that family. By the time the flowers really open up, it looks a lot less like a member of the carrot family, but it nonetheless is. The leaves are here which when you get your iron for them are quite easy. The only thing is they do look remarkably like the leaves of wooden enemy. So in fact, I think, yeah, we've got wooden enemy here and the sanical there. They're, they're actually horribly similar. Now I see them side by side. There is a difference. There's a difference between the, the, the way the leaf is divided and actually the stem when it flowers is very different with this red ridging. And obviously the, the flower is, is completely different. Sanical is another ancient woodland indicator species. It doesn't tend to colonise new areas and wherever you find it will very much tell you you're in ancient woodland. So I should say with the, the woodland indicator species, if you just find one on its own, it doesn't necessarily mean you've got an ancient woodland. Uh, what it is is finding the assemblage of them. Here in this woodland, we're absolutely overwhelmed by them. So there's no way this could be anything but an ancient woodland. If you find one, there's a reasonable chance you're in an ancient woodland because, as I said, they're very poor at colonising new habitats. But as soon as you find three, four, five and upwards from that, then it really tells you you are in ancient woodland. Stitchwort is a real stunner at this time of year. It is a woodland plant, but actually you see it a lot on good quality roadside verges on, on banks underneath hedgerows. I guess it's a sort of a, a bank, hedgeside and woodland plant. There's two types of stitchwort which grow in these environments, greater stitchwort and lesser stitchwort. This is greater stitchwort. It's a much larger plant than lesser stitchwort, but the, the way really to do it apart from size, is if you have a look at the petals on each flower. Now this one, which has opened up a bit more, you can see a bit more clearly, there's actually five petals around the flower. And the way to remember it, the plant is named after how much of the petal is joined. With this one, slightly over half the petal is joined, so the greater part of the petal is joined, and therefore it's greater stitch work. With lesser stitchwort, not much of the petal is joined, so they're much, much more divided and therefore lesser stitchwort. Stitchwort is so called because in the olden days it was believed to be a cure for stitches, i.e. the sort of cramping pain you get uh, during running, particularly ill-prepared running, uh, which clearly was, was an issue for people in the, in the medieval times. This is a violet, nothing you can really mistake it with once you know it is a violet. Uh, these intensely purple colours, 
They're a slightly complicated genus because there's quite a few of them. If you find them in a wood, they're very likely to be one of the dog varlets. The other ones, you've got a hairy varlet, which is more of a grassland one, and then you have heath varlets, you have fen varlets, and so on. The fact that it's mainly purple points you towards dog violet and tells you it's not a pansy. Now, if you have a look at the back of the flower, you'll see there's this structure called a hypanthium or a spur. This is the nectar containing tube uh, and sticks out the back of the flower. And this is how you tell the dog violets apart. You can see on this one, it's a slightly white color. It's definitely a different color from the rest of the flower and that would tell you it's common dog violet. If you see one with a purple spur on, it's early dog violet. And I always remember that purple early, as in early purple, the orchid. Now, I used to be very confident about those, and it's one of those genuses, unfortunately, the more you find out about them, to some extent, the less confident you come. You do occasionally, unfortunately, get common dog violet with slightly more purple spurs and vice versa. So you have to be a bit careful and you may have to look at other characteristics, but it's a fairly good rule of thumb for telling them apart. You can't come into a native British woodland in the spring without seeing bluebells or without talking about bluebells. Uh, and here they are. They've gone slightly over, but we're actually we're at the peak time of year where the bluebells are going over, but all the other flora is starting to emerge. I won't say that much about bluebell. I'm sure a lot of you realise there's a issue with the non-native Spanish bluebell, which has come into many woodlands. These are all native bluebells, uh, and there's a few pointers for telling them apart. The first thing is they tend to have these flowers which dangle over on one side, whereas with the Spanish one, you have them much more sort of coming up centrally and sticking out in every direction. The leaves are generally much more narrow, although that isn't completely reliable as a characteristic. And then one of the key things is that they have these white anthers, so the pollen-bearing organs within the flower, which you can see pretty well at this time of year, are a sort of creamy white colour. In the Spanish bluebell, they're blue colour. Now the complication is, because the two hybridise, it's complicated. There's all sort of different levels of hybridization between the two. It's often the hybrid that you tend to see in the wild rather than the pure Spanish. And I think there's more information emerging over the years at telling them apart and the way they do actually interact. There's excellent information on the Natural History Museum website about bluebells if you want to know more. This is Bugle, a Juga reptans. It's a member of the dead nettle family, which actually it's a, it's a fairly underrepresented family in woodlands. There's, there's not many members of it. Distinctive things about the dead nettle family, uh, opposite leaves, a square stem, which you can just about see here. There's corners on it. They're often very aromatic. So there's members of the family like uh, mint and basil and so on. And they've got this, this sort of double lipped flower with a lower lip and an upper lip. It's what's called bilateral symmetry, so you can divide the flower down the middle. The lovely thing about bugle, even when it isn't flowering, you get this sort of purple furriness to the underleaves. So even before it comes out, it's actually still a very colourful little plant. This is a plant called toothwort, which is a truly bizarre plant. It's fully parasitic in that it can't make any of its own food. Uh, it grows next to trees, generally hazel trees, and it invades their root system and parasitizes them for their nutrients. I think it probably doesn't have a huge effect on a, on a larger tree. It may be a problem for a young sapling, but it's always specific to its host tree. When eventually this hazel tree dies, the toothwort will die with it because it's completely reliant upon it. A plant we've got a lot of here is dog's mercury, and you do often get it occurring in quite large quantities in woodland. It's an interesting plant because it's what's called dioecious, and that means you have separate male plants and female plants, which is quite uncommon. Uh, plants like holly do the same thing, and juniper. It's interesting here because we've got on this side of the track almost entirely male plants, and they're easy to sit this time of year because we've got the male flowers with these anthers, the, the pollen bearing parts of it, um, sort of dangling out of each flower with this yellow coloration. On the other side of the track, 
gathered around this tree, we've got almost exclusively female flowers. Completely different with these fruits. They're, they're called capers. If you're familiar with capers, they look rather similar to it. Very swollen, and they've got the stigmas, which are they're just sort of going over now, but these brown, shriveled parts on the top, which is catching the pollen and putting it into the seeds. The interesting thing about it is, is you tend to get these huge clumps of one sex. So in fact, everything on this side of the track, I think, is female. So it's working well here because we've got males, we've got females. Sometimes in isolated woodland, you really do just get a single sex. Similar to the wood anemone, they actually, they're not very good seed producers despite this whole dioecious thing going on. And again, they'll spread very slowly through the ground. So they don't tend to be good at colonizing new sites. This is called butcher's broom. It's a really unusual uh, shrub. It only grows in woodland, particularly ancient woodland. It's named so because butchers used to use it to wipe the entrails off their chopping blocks. The reason it's so good for that is it's incredibly tough. It's a sort of robust, spiky thing. And the unusual thing is these structures here, which, which for all intents and purposes looks like leaves, but actually they're modified sections of stem called cladodes. Uh, and that is what enables them to be so incredibly tough and spiky. And they've got these spines at the end as well. What that means is that you get these rather unusual fruits and flowers which come straight out of the clado, giving the impression they've sort of come out of nowhere on, on these leaf-like structures. They're quite small and green at the moment, but as the year progresses, they'll, they'll get much larger and go red, and they're, they're huge by the end. It gives a slight of sort of resemblance of holly, but actually with even plumper red berries which just sit on these cladodes. So hopefully you've learnt about a few of the key species which grow in woodland and that will help you enjoy and understand woodland. The key things you can do really for woodland, if possible try and buy woodland products. There's all sorts of things you can buy now from charcoal to your barbecues to hazel coppice poles to grow your beans up and all of those things will actively support woodland management. Come and volunteer for your local wildlife trust or RSPB and you can come out to the woods and take part in coppicing and other forms of management. Or come on a course either run by us or someone else and learn more about the, the, the plants, the mosses and the birds which grow in woodland. But the main thing really is just to come out to a woodland and enjoy it because at this time of year there really is nothing quite like it.